All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Coach's Corner on the Fitter and Faster Swim platform. I'm your host, Mike Murray, and today we are thrilled to introduce you to the Director of Team Services at USA Swimming, multiple Olympic medalist, Brendan Hansen, as we discuss the progression from age grouper to Olympian. And Brendan, there perhaps is no one better to talk about this topic than you. So welcome, Brendan. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you? Doing great. It was great to catch up with you. Before we get started with you, I want to remind our viewers that we're open to all your questions in the chat box. However, if you spam the chat box, you'll be immediately removed from the webinar. If our viewers stay to the end of the discussion today, we will award one participant with a free fitter and faster mask and beach towel. Brendan, I don't know if this is the case with you, but I've been telling people all week, I'm hanging my masks on my blinker in the truck. And every time I open my window, and I know you're opening windows in Austin, Texas, I'm, I've lost like three or four masks. So <laughs> here's an opportunity for people to uh, grab that mask that flew out the window. Um, I want to introduce my friend and former and fellow coach, Brendan Hansen, former coach at Austin Swim Club. Hansen is a six-time Olympic medalist, also a former world record holder in both the 100 and 200 meter breaststroke. While attending the University of Texas at Austin, Brendan swam for legendary coach Eddie Reese in NCAA competition from 2001 to 2005. I know a lot about you, dude. I did not know that during your entire collegiate career, you never lost a breaststroke event. That's awesome. You're, you're not going to hear me say that over the talks that we've had. But. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan was a 16-time All-American and won 14 NCAA National Championships. He graduated from the University of Texas with a bachelor's degree in kinesiology in 2005. Brendan won a total of 25 medals in the international competition, 18 gold, four silver, and three bronze, spanning the Olympics, World and Pan Pac Championships, and a member of the 2012 United States Olympic team and won a bronze in the 100 meter breaststroke and a gold in the four by 100 meter medley relay at the 2012 Summer Olympics. Brennan, I also want recognition that here at the Fitter and Faster Swim Tour, we are gonna be the first people to publicly wish you a happy birthday this year. <laughs> Thanks, dude. I know it's coming up in two days. You're gonna be 39? Yeah. Uh, 39, yep. Woo, buddy. Last year, we got to live it up before we hit 40. We really do. We'll figure out a way to do it. We've had a lot of good memories working together at National Select Camp and having some of our athletes have had great races against each other at juniors and nationals. It's been fun to get to know you over the past quad, man. I'm so happy to have you on this year. Yeah, it was great to get the call, man. I'm stoked to be here. So, ice-breaking question number one, my friend. You have the reputation – of now being the unofficial assistant coach for all USA Swimming Clubs nationwide as part of your role with team services. You've played an enormous part in helping teams navigate this COVID-19 pandemic, including my very own Victor Swim Club. What's been the biggest, team, biggest challenge that teams are sharing throughout this global health crisis? Uh, this isn't an icebreaker. This is a loaded question. No, um, it, it's, the, hard, the biggest challenge right now is finding pool space, uh, adapting, pivoting, trying to find ways. Um, it's such a fluid conversation and situation that we're in that um, the, the biggest challenge is, is to understand what tomorrow is going to bring. And I'm not talking about the end of the week or the end of the month or whatever it is, but it's just trying to really understand and assess what the situations are in front of you. And then, and then try to adapt. And, and the biggest challenge for us as an NGB is that what you're dealing with up in Victor Swim Club in uh, upstate New York is not what Southern California or Austin, Texas or, you know, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah are dealing with. And so the, the locality of this whole situation and how it's affecting, you know, your, your local and state governments is, is been the biggest challenge. Um, but I'm a positive guy, Mike. You know that about me. The biggest absolutely, upside, yeah. The biggest upside is w w the communication between USA Swimming and its members has never been better and getting better. And I'm not saying it's the greatest it's ever been, but it's definitely on the way up. And and that's one of the things that we worked hard on with with our group is to just to really 
uh, try to serve our members and, and be the best we can be with them as we try to navigate through this. Cause we're, we always talk so much about being one family, one voice, you know, one community. Like we know the swimming community is like two degrees of separation from anybody, you know? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. It's just funny how you and I grew up swimming together in, in the middle Atlantic area. And, and, and then all of a sudden, 15 years later, we're on a pool deck together in Colorado Springs, working with some of the best athletes in the world. Right. So it's, like, it's nuts how that all happens. But with that comes some communication challenges and we just have to, we have to go back to our roots as a community, which is take care of each other, take care of the athletes and, and find a way to get better. Absolutely, Brendan. And admittedly, there have been some major shifts and changes with USA Swimming throughout the pandemic. What are some things that we can look forward to with you coming in and directing team services as we move forward? Uh, transparency uh, is probably the number one thing. I, I, I'm, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I'm here to help you get to get there. I'm help you to offer resources and tools for you. I'm, I'm, that's the one thing that I, I, I wanted to change and, and, and work with USA Swimming on as we, and they were already doing it to an extent, but I really wanted to bring it to the forefront. Um, if we have experts in the office, which we do, um, I shouldn't be the one delivering that message, they should. So what's been great is having a lot of our executive team, a lot of our strategy team, a lot of our board in front of our membership, having these conversations. Mike, you've been, uh, you know, a, a, in, in those situations, you've had those conversations with these folks. And it's, Absolutely. Just, yeah, it's just nice to see um, the faces come out and, and, and really uh, put a face with the name and who's really behind working hard for uh, this organization. Well, you know, I think on behalf of USA Swimming Coaches and you and I are friends, so I can say this, you know, authentically is I think we're excited as USA Swimming Clubs to have somebody who's super passionate and understands the club level struggles, right? So a lot of times, you know, us club level coaches, when we're first getting started or we're the coach of a smaller team or we're working our club to get to the next step in the organization, we oftentimes are looking at leaders in USA Swimming who are at this level where they don't necessarily understand the struggles from a small team or a small club. And I know that you understand that as you started to build Austin Swim Club in the time that you were there. So on behalf of our coaches, I know that many of us are super excited that you're, that you're going to be a part of USA Swimming at this level. Yeah. And, you know, one of the first things I did when I joined USA Swimming was look at the demographic across all of our USA Swimming clubs. And 60 some percent of our clubs are in that 80 to 100 swimmers. And they're all run by one or two you know, club coaches, they don't have a board, you know, they run on a, a tight, lean budget. And so, I mean, that's, that's the majority of our membership is like that. And, those, and, and what's crazy is that's the, that's what develops our Olympic teams, right? Like, I mean, yes, we have our powerhouse gold, silver, and bronze medal clubs around the country, but I, like I said, there, that's 200 clubs of almost, you know, 3000 clubs. And so what makes up the rest is really, where my focus is, is and, and because um, that's where that's where our 2028 and 2032 teams are going to come from, Mike. You know, one of the things in our pre-production talk that really resonated with me, you were talking about how the 2020 Olympic team is going to look very different. Tell me about why you're so excited about this group of potential athletes. And and, you know, we would be at the Olympic Games right now had everything been normal. But tell me what you're excited about, about this potential team in 2020. I think uh, the conversations, I, I want to say the conversation started with how we were both kind of bummed that we were not at trials, right? And the, the, that event in the general, how fun it is, and then the competitiveness. And, and my theory is, is that when I do talk to the national team, the group, uh, national team department, they're like, the more competitive trials is, the better we are battle proven going into the Olympics. And having done it four times in my career, I can agree to that comment where I saw the shift and I was looking at the numbers and just from a kind of a geeked out performance club coach guy that also swam competitively for 20, 20 years, I just saw a, a huge surge in um, our national junior team. Mitch Dalton did a fantastic job with that group, uh, giving them the exposure internationally when they needed it. And I just saw that like, I felt like there was a plus or minus six months of them either making the Olympic team or not. Right. It's the, um, 
it's the, that group of kids I was waiting for them to see them break through. And I felt like they may be six months short uh, of, of really doing that from a maturity level, like keeping it together in front of 11,000 people with pyrotechnics on the, on the, you know, on the deck. And so um, now I think they're going to get that buffer. And with that buffer comes uh, a much more competitive trials. And I think with a competitive trials, we can sit here all day with the data and, and really look at who we think is going to come out. But um, a lot of these kids are hungry, man. And they're going to be more hungry with the fact that they got told they couldn't do it this summer. And when you take away that privilege and you realize it can be taken away, I think that makes them all really dangerous. And it would be real interesting the last 30 meters of a lot of these races. And I love that you brought that up in pre-production. We were talking about trying to get our athletes in a position where inside that last 30 meters, if you're having a great day, somebody else may not, you have a chance of making that team. And I know you know what it feels like to make the team from out front. And then eight years later, you know what it feels like to kind of be the underdog, make the team, and then go on to be the underdog and then still medal in the Olympics. So talk about what it's like, Brennan, because part of our discussion today is going to be what it takes to go from where you were at Foxcatcher and Suburban Swim Club as an age group athlete to what it took to eventually make the Olympic team. But just talk about giving yourself or giving your athletes the, the best position to make a team. Talk about what that process is like as we get started here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll break it into two parts, the, the swimmer aspect in me and then the coach aspect in me. The swimmer aspect in me is I want the opportunity. If I don't make finals, I'm mad. I'm not mad because I don't get a chance to go at best time. I'm mad because I don't get another chance to prove myself. Um, as a swimmer, and I was get taught by these coaches you're talking about as I was getting written, I would get nervous about the ex expectations of what I put on myself, what my goals were, things of that nature as a kid growing up and maturing. But what I started to realize is that my coaches would start telling me, like, look, the swim meet is just a celebration. It's just a party. It's an opportunity for you to showcase everything you've been showing me every single day of practice. And when I started to make, look at it that way and I looked at the lane, regardless if it was lane eight, lane four or whatever, if I just bought myself another opportunity to prove myself, that's all you can ask for yourself. And then from then, you build a plan. And with a plan, you're the most dangerous person on the pool deck. The only athletes I was ever scared of uh, racing against were the ones that I looked around. I was like, oh, they're they're like in that learning state. They're watching video. They're asking questions. They're engaged. It's the people that would look at a psych sheet and go, I'm top C. This is awesome. I'm like, you're 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 the most beatable person on this pool deck today. Um, so I think I think when we look at that and just trying to how you put yourself in that position, you you have uh, you, there's so many uncontrollables, right? But there are things that can push the odds in your favor. One of those is, is a great relationship with your coach to where you can communicate with them in a way to where they know how you're feeling. And, and that that was crucial in all of my experiences from club to college to pro to Olympic. Um, sure. The other thing is, is to have a plan and it's your plan and it's specific to you. Um, I mean, I, 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 I had a really uh, nice race strategy when I would go up and it would change and we tweak it and, and I would be excited to execute the plan. That's what I go. I get behind the blocks and I'm like, I'm so pumped to show everybody what we've created, you know, and, and, and be able to showcase it. So um, from a coaching standpoint, the biggest struggle is a lot of times in those situations I'm talking about, you don't have a say you're, you, you have no control. So you do all of this prep work with them leading up to it, cycles and taper and resting and, you know, different strength programs and things like that. So you're doing all of this building of this of this knowledge and talent and uh, physical fitness. And then it turns around. And when the gun goes off, you're just standing there. <laughs> That's right. And 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 you, you see all different kinds of coaches in that in that matter. Right. Like You have people screaming and yelling and flipping out. And you got other coaches sitting down with their like this biting their nails. But um, what I learned, I think you got to learn as a coach is to teach your athletes how to apply what you're teaching them. Um, when we, when we dive into those details of what you and I are going to talk about with the being rate, like being brought up in the sport, it wasn't just, here's what I want you to do. There was always a why component to it. 
And, and that was so important to me understanding the process and me buying into the process to then me ultimately repeating it multiple times, regardless of the scenario of what I was in. Right. And that, again, from a coaching standpoint, puts the odds in your favor that when that kid gets pushed to shove in that 30 meters, they're going to respond the way you want them to. And then you just get to turn into the greatest cheerleader of all time. Right. So. Absolutely. And it's that's, fair, to, fair to say that you and I are sweating more than most coaches at swim meets. Yeah. I mean, like uh, it, I'm more, I think I'm more emotionally exhausted after a swim meet, even if it's not even my own athletes. Right. Like I just, and I, and I have such great relationship with so many coaches out there that I want to see. And I know the heart, the blood, sweat and tears that you guys put into your, your jobs where I want to, I want to see them be successful. Right. And I know it takes a village and I just want to see the village freak out. Right. When somebody touches the wall first. Uh, we're all in this together, man. Like I said in the beginning, one family, one voice. And and when somebody does well, it's really exciting to see it all play out. I want to talk to you about a moment that, that you just described because I remember it vividly. Uh, 2004, outside Olympic trials. You break the world record in finals in a 100-meter breaststroke. You're coming out of the pool. Eddie, Ian, Aaron are all right there. And they're all super excited for you. And the first thing you said was, that did not just happen. Can you talk about that moment? Yeah, I I remember you always talk about breaking a world record. And I remember walking into Eddie's office uh, 18 months prior to that race and saying it was the summer of 2003. And we were going to Barcelona, Spain for world championships. And I told Eddie, I said, look, I'm going to race against this Japanese kid. I can't even really say his name. I think it's like Kazuke Kitajima or something like that. I was like, I want to beat him. And Eddie was like, well, he's going to break the world record. And I said, okay, so I'm going to break the world record. So how do I do that? And his looked me straight in the eyes and he said, you got to do more than I ask of you every single day in practice. If you do that, you have the odds in your favor that you're going to, you're going to be able to respond to him when, when you go up and race him. And we raced that summer and I, I was like real close to the American record and, and whatnot. But I, I was like, it, again, it, it's not, it's not like you have this conversation and six months later, it's, it's going to come to fruition, right? Like I, it was a longer process than both of us thought. And then when we led into trials, the race strategy going into that race was nail the first three strokes and then feed off the crowd, the next 38. And that's what I did. And I, I just, I gained confidence as I got through the race, each stroke felt better than the last, uh, I felt off the crowd and I knew it. And when it happens, it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that you're the, you, you've been in the sport, you grew up in it. Sorry, my dog. Uh, you grew up in it and whatnot, but, um, you, you never realize like you, you, it's hard for you to warm down in the pool and realize like, wow, I'm the fastest person to ever swim this race ever. Like that's a really hard statement to, to, to grasp. Well, it, it was a really poignant moment to watch because that race culminated in almost a perfect swim from a stroke count perspective, uh, from a splitting perspective. I mean, it was a really beautiful race to watch. And, and uh, you know, you talked about how you and Eddie had a plan for that and that he wasn't scared to tell you that, look, this kid's gonna be really fast and it's gonna take a world record to beat him. What did it mean to you to lay down that performance at trials getting ready to go to Athens? Uh, it was, a, uh, I mean, if you, you back, this, back this story all the way up to 2000 where I missed the Olympic team by two and a half of a second in the same race, right? And I get third and then two days later I get third in the 200 breaststroke, like, you, you started off with, I can't believe I didn't know that you didn't lose a race in college. The reason I didn't lose a race in college is because of that experience. I, I get third twice at trials and I'm like, this is the worst feeling ever. And I don't ever want to feel this way. Walked on the university of Texas and I go, Eddie, I know you saw what happened at trials. I know you saw me crying in the diving well. I'm not that person. I think you're the guy that's going to get me to where I want to be. How do I get there? And he just said, you got to use that as fuel every day. You want to quit. You got to think about how you felt in the diving well. And I did. And I never, I never took away that sight. And it wasn't until I got to trials in 2004 and swam that race at finals and broke the world record to where it was like, really like four years later is when it finally came to full circle and 2000 trials, the results of that made sense to me. And that's why I try to tell kids all the time. I'm like, 
And that's why I think coaches, they try to fix things on the pool deck right after the race. And I'm like, look, dude, it took me four years to wrap my head around a third place finish at trials. Don't try to fix it right after finals. Be like, look, it's okay to be vulnerable as a coach and say, which is what Eddie did in that conversation leading into my freshman year of college. Like, look, man, it's okay. You're probably the trials is not going to make sense to you for a while, but use it as a fuel to go into the, to the, to be a, a longhorn and, and, and trying to be the best you can be in your sport and practice every day. Like don't, don't lose a sight of a great, uh, a great failure at the highest level to fuel you. 18 months later, I'm number one in the world and I have the American record in the 100 and 200 breaststroke. Why? Because of 2000 trials. Like, so 2004 was a combination of, you know, getting knocked down and getting back up, which from where you and I are from is kind of how we're, br we're bred, man. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I remember sitting in a bar in Omaha with you uh, with a couple of our families and, uh, and, and the kids swam great. And I remember you saying to them very organically, you know, cause we had known each other and you had come up and you mentioned to them, two of you just finished in the top 25 at Olympic trials at 17. Like let, okay. We missed our best time by a couple of tenths, but let's evaluate where we are right now. And how are you going to use this experience to get better? And when we talk about our topic today, which is age grouper to Olympian, nobody better to discuss that progression than you. Why is it so important for us coaches and especially for our parents to understand that we have to accept these benchmarks and the small victories and the big defeats, right? The, the big failures are really what our future success is going to be predicated on. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, look, first, first and foremost, uh, you're going to fail your way to success in anything. So the sport of swimming prepares you for life. And I think coaches, that's what we, 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 we see, right? Cause if you're a great coach in this sport and you see your athletes come back, they're all, they're all extremely successful outside of the sport because if you can teach them properly how to, handle failure and and how to push the limits and how to move forward they're going to they're going to do the exact same thing in anything else that they do and what ends up happening is is they join a team a company whatever it may be and they and they thrive and so when i was when i was growing up i i just when i was growing up i remember being told like give it everything you got for as long as you got and then if it doesn't pan out it's okay because you're you it's the work is still in the vault. And I remember Charlie Kennedy, my suburban coach telling me the crazy thing about this sport, Brennan, and this is, he was a potential 1980 Olympian, right? And they boycotted and he didn't get a chance to compete in there. He just said this sport. No. Yeah. He just says it never, it never happens when you want it to, but if you continue to work hard, it will happen. And so you have, there has to be this level of respect for the sport when you're playing it. And, and we as coaches need to teach that. We need to teach them that, look, it ain't going to happen when you want it to. So get that out of your head. But if you meet the sport halfway every single day and try to push the limits on what the sport's trying to push back on you, that's where the fun starts. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's the, what's crazy is we can go through my whole story, but I, and I talked to kids and I talked to a lot of kids on Zoom as we came out of COVID. And I was like, look, I'm not the most talented person on this Zoom call. Right. But like the reason I was a one percenter of one percent and you just said all those stats and I can't even remember them. Do I care about them? But <laughs> it, a lot of it, it, it just comes down to the fact that I was willing to I was willing to meet the sport. And I had a, a, a respect for the sport that was going to that if I pushed on it, it was going to teach me something. And I, and I liked it. I liked that something and I liked that person that it was, it was creating. And um, I really had fun with the people in the sport too. So I hope that answers your question. I don't think it did, but that's, that's kind no, of, that's great, man, because it, it's a great segue into a conversation that you and I had in pre-production about competitiveness. I played darts with you and you are <laughs> locked in. I don't like playing darts with Brendan Hansen. Yeah. Locked well, in. Yeah. Can we, can we yeah. teach kids to be competitive or is it something that's intrinsic? 
I think this is a nature versus nurture comment. So everyone's going to say one thing or another. I'll tell you this, where I found the most success as an athlete and as a coach to get the more competitiveness out of them is one, show it to them. If they see it, they believe it. They have to believe it before anybody else does. You can say, you can sell, you can do whatever you think as a coach and think that they're going to do it. But until that kid sees the results, they're not going to believe it. They need to see progress. You need to create progress. There were, there were sets that Eddie would give me that I knew he was giving to me that I was going to fail on. But when I succeeded in them, I was like, when's the next meet? I don't care what kind of my taper's like. I'm going to absolutely rewrite the record books. You know, like he created situations, not sets, but situations in practice that was going to allow me to see the results I needed to see to know that that goal was attainable. That world record was attainable. That's next level stuff. And that's, that's where I feel like um, where, where I had the most success in getting kids to be confident and, and, and feel like they could do what they need to do and race and be competitive is when I told them, make sure they remember racing you. That's the number one line I said. And guess what? That's the number one line said. And from there was a, a great um, breaststroker when I was coming up. His name was Kurt Grote. And Kurt Grote was, uh, he went to Stanford. He's a doctor now on the West Coast. And I remember him saying to me, and I remember the uh, first time I met him, I called him by his first and last name like the whole time, right? Like I was at like <laughs> Olympic Training Center and I was like, hey, Kurt Grote, do you need water? Hey, Kurt Grote, you know, <laughs> can I get some? He's like, you can just call me Kurt. But I remember him telling me on that trip, again, this is how we iron sharpens iron with USA Swimming is that this guy had, I mean, he knew I was the up and coming breaststroker. He didn't have to tell me anything that was going to make me better. But he did. Why? Because that's the culture of our sport and USA Swimming. And he said, Brennan, you can't control what the seven people you're going to race against do ever. You can't control what I'm going to do to you in practice. But make sure they remember you being at this workout. Make sure they remember racing the guy in lane two or lane eight or lane four. And I never forgot that. And what that did <laughs> took the pressure off of me to feel like I needed to worry about the result. I got less result driven. I got more process driven. And I was more competitive in the moment. And that's what you're asking me, right? Like, how do you stay competitive in the moment? And I, and I believe that. Like, it's that mindset of, one, you show them the results in practice. So they have this history that they know that's capable of doing it, right? Show me the money. There's the money. You go into a swim meet and you tell them, you make sure that they remember racing a kid from Victor Swim Club, right? Exactly. They remember what that cap is on their cap and when they swim past you and they race. And you're like, well, guess what? That kid's like Iron Man, you know? They're like, now, now your team walks out looking like the Avengers and you look like a genius. <laughs> That's so true. And I really appreciate you talking a little bit about the history of American breaststrokers because that's part and parcel today of what we're talking about. As you move through the progression and you're part of this historic group of athletes in USA Swimming. So before you, we had Rock Santos, Mike Barriman, Kurt Grote, Brendan Hansen, and it set up this legacy uh, and this tradition of success. Did you feel the burden of that tradition coming up? Not burden. Jeremy Lin's another one on that list you need to put on there. But it yeah, absolutely is. Yep. Yeah, because I mean, he grew up in Pennsylvania, um, you know, and then on the girl side, we, uh, Christy Kowal, Kristen Woodrin, there was just a ton of like minute breaststrokers, a yards that when that was like really, really fast. Tara Kirk. Yeah, they all came out of there too. So I think it was um there was there was some like uh not a rite of passage. There was no burden. It was more of like a okay, I'm home. Like these are my people, you know? Like uh Kyle Salyards is the guy that touched me out in 2000 to make the Olympic team and we raced 3 weeks later or 4 4 months prior to that race at the Olympic trials where he beats me out. We get first and third at the Olympic trials. We're racing at Pennsylvania High School States in the 100 breaststroke. How about that? I mean, like and you're in front of 2,000 people at Penn State, right? So, And Gangloff was in the mix back then. There was such a good crop. Yeah, and you see that, right? You see these waves come through, and as, as USA Swimming, we pay attention to it and adjust, right? We also see areas where we're lacking, like the distance swimming areas and 400s and miles where we need to pick up and ways we can do that. So, you know, from our perform high performance side of things, that's what we focus on. But Pennsylvania growing up, man, it was just – 
um, you knew you were going to race somebody that was going to race you back. And so you either got eaten or you learned how to eat. And, and that was, that was kind of the mentality. And, and my, you know, I know we're going to talk about my parents, but my parents stayed out of it. Why? Because they had to, because they were working a whole time. Um, and so, um, I really relied on my coaches to, to kind of teach me the competitive side of things. And I, and I learned how to focus my energy in the appropriate ways, right? Like, it wasn't that I was more competitive than you, Mike. I coached against you. I've walked by you and before finals and said, I'm going to out coach you tonight. And you looked at me. Like, <laughs> I, I looked at you. You looked at me like it was, you were playing darts, right? So I, I don't care. It's Brennan Hansen. Let's go. I, well, that's my thing, right? And that's we need more of that because when coaches are competitive like that and kids can see the fun nature and coaches being competitive against each other, that's when the kids win. If, if they're, well, I'll tell you what, man. Is be, is be an example, you know. I'm so glad you mentioned that because as a young coach, I relished, I mean, absolutely relished the, the moments where I had one of our club athletes beat an athlete from <laughs> a well-known coach or a well-known club and then feel the question afterwards, where, where is Victor again? I'm happy to tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah, we we have to get our younger coaches to not be afraid to step up to that. Well, it's not just a step up. There's two steps to that. And I and I believe that there is a cockiness to this and a confidence aspect that what every pool deck I walked on as a coach, I was like, I'm the best coach here. Yep. I believe that. I truly believe that. I still believe that. That being said, the reason I would I, I say that that is true and you can look at me going shaking your head like, well, then why are you not coaching anymore right now? I, I am on a, on a higher level, but um, it's because I would walk around the pool deck and I would continue to ask questions like I would pay attention to who kicked my butt at finals in yeah. off the walls or had better turns in my team or was just right off the speed off the top. And I would like I would seek out that coach in hospitality or something like I was a stalker. And what beauty of it was is that everybody, like, everybody was like, oh, I'd love to talk to Brendan Hansen. But I was like, give me your information. Like I, yeah. you know, I never took away the tinkering mentality of the prelims to finals, adjust the plan. I took that same into that same mentality into coaching where I was like, OK, that guy is absolutely or that gal is absolutely crushing it. What did she do? And I'm going to go find out and I'm going to act like an idiot. And I'm just going to say, hey, look. Tell me what you're doing because that it, coaches like that recognition. They deserve that recognition. You never get it. So why not give it? Right. Exactly. In return, you get this information to go back to your team and you tell your team because in the transparency of it, you say, hey, look, you know, that team that's kicking out like three meters. I figured out what they're doing. Wait till September, man. We're going to crush it. And they're like, yes, you plant that seed. And then they're like, they're good. Competitiveness in coaching is a must. Staying in the learn state has to be part of that conversation. That's so, that's so true. And, and that's something that I think Jack Roach does a really good job teaching us younger generation is being present in the moment to identify the aspects that we can work on to get better and then focus on those things instead of getting caught up in everything else, right? So when you're competing at a really high level, there are gonna be times where you fail and that's like a little chink in your suit of armor. And some people go right to fixing that weakness or some people focus on the weakness consuming them. And that's such an incredible part of developing from an age group swimmer into an Olympian. Give me a story or talk a little bit about some of the times where you failed and you translated that experience into success. I don't, I don't know how much time you got, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> man i i remember i mean growing up as a kid at fox catcher a six lane 50 meter pool fox catcher farms john dupont estate uh i remember swimming it growing up swimming in a 50 meter pool and uh not being the most attentive kid in practice and coach yelling at me a lot uh he obviously recognized the talent in me, told my parents about it, um, but would push me. And I remember missing intervals and things of that nature. And again, this is a different time, right? Like missing intervals and having to restart the set over again because uh, I just wasn't I wasn't paying attention to the sets and stuff. And started realizing, like making the connection that 
the kids that were beating me at swim meets were not necessarily more talented than me. They were just more engaged in the sport. They were more students of the sport. They were continually learning. And so once I, from that lesson of missing intervals in practice and going second or third in my lane to, okay, I remember asking my mom or dad, I was like, hey, my dad was a collegiate athlete in wrestling, but I remember asking him like, dad, I, I'm not, I'm not beating these guys. Like, are they taller than me? Like, what's the deal? And he's like, Brennan, they're just, you're not, you're not engaging in practice. Like you, you, you just go through the motions. Like that's not how, yeah. not how you're going to get any better. And I, I, I mean, and I just remember being like, I need to change my approach. Even at like 11, I just didn't like it. I was like, no, this is not happening. Um, and that's when I started to make those adjustments in workout I saw the results right away. I was like, wow, this is crazy. My actions, my results. And then I go to a swim meet and I go faster. And all of a sudden I started to see that. Um, a lot of that process was probably put on me organically from my coach. I don't, sure. I was not mature enough at 11 years old to, to, to give, to say that I came up with that on the way. There was absolutely no way. Um, there was just ways for him to strategically help me get there. Um, I remember going to a zone meet for middle Atlantic, making the 200 IM. I didn't make the hundred breaststroke. I was 14 years old. It was the only meet or only event I had made for the meet. And I was the team captain and I went up to the blocks and I took my mark. And I remember kind of being cocky and like kind of joking around with my friends and being light and my coach who was Bob Platt at the time, you know, yep. so, and Bob was like, Brennan, you've got to focus. If you don't focus, this is not going to go well. And I'm like, Bob, it's prelims. I got this. No big deal. Don't worry about it. I got up there. I flinched on the start. They called me off. I never dumped in the water. I remember oh. I went all the way to zone meet. I was the captain of the team, and I never swam a race. Were we at Were we at Pitt or UMBC back then? I was at, I was at, it was at Princeton at the time. Princeton, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And – and then it was at Rutgers later, but uh, yeah. So, and, and I just remember like those being the most teachable moments for me. Like I didn't really, I don't I, like when you talk about what's crazy to me is, and we lead with this, right? Like we, 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 we condition ourselves to this. Like, what did you talk about in the beginning of this whole conversation? You talked about all of my accolades. I didn't learn crap from that. <laughs> like, right. Like the 25 Olympic medal or 25 international medals. One, I don't know where they are. And two, I don't have one lesson that I learned in those moments where I won. It was all like, you know, um, I, I felt like I was hungrier and wanted it more when it didn't happen. And I lost, I lost a race or, um, the practice didn't go the way I wanted it to. And then what I realized is like starting to seek out my coach to get feedback, right? Like not waiting for them to come to me, but if a workout didn't go the way I wanted it to, or a race didn't go the way I wanted to. I was like, I don't want that to happen. That was me like taking full ownership of it and then saying, okay, what do I got to change? It may not be what I, you know, may not be in the race, but maybe it's my attitude and practice or whatever it may be. So there is a, I can't really give you a lot of like specific failures. All I can say is that a lot of those failures were, were really the biggest teaching moments. And, and as coaches, we can't shy away from those. Absolutely. Those are the times where like, and, and again, you got to know your athletes. Like it amazes me. Like when I worked with, you know, 25 national team kids at, at ASC and 15 of them had trials cuts. Each one of them I had to deal with differently. I had one boy that was a hothead. He'd friend the race. And if it didn't go the way he wanted to, I was like, look, you and I are not going to have the same conversation for at least an hour. So you go that way. I'll go this way. And then in an hour, we'll have an adult conversation about how we do this forward, you know? And we have to be comfortable saying that, right? Like recognizing you have that to. moment. Recognizing that moment when you every part of you as a coach wants to say, look at the way that you're approaching your emotional response to this is a hundred percent wrong. I don't think that that has any traction inside of the moment. What has no. traction inside of the moment is I recognize that you're feeling a certain way. You go deal with that right now and then we'll regroup. Yeah. And again, there's two, there's two pluses to that. One, you're giving them ownership of the moment, right? You're acknowledging that it was a crappy swim. You're acknowledging that they're upset, which is what they want. And you just say, Hey, look, you get yourself in a state to where we can have a conversation that's positive and you do what you have to do to get that back. If they're 16 to 18 years old, you're teaching them how to do that. 
Exactly you know, right. They come back hot and heavy. You're like, hey, man, that didn't work. Whatever you did didn't work, you know? And a lot of coaches end up getting back into that wall and they keep going like, well, that kid's just a hothead and he just won't. And I'm like, you got to you gotta find the creative way to get to them. And a lot of times that's just meeting them halfway. But p- coaches like don't want to do that because it's my system and my way of doing it. And this that's fine. But your way of, of processing something is going to be different than every other kid's way of processing it. Absolutely. So your system may work for you, but it's not necessarily going to work for them. And you're going to get real frustrated real fast if you don't find a way to, to, to get that light bulb to go off and allow them to take ownership of it. And I, I, I firmly believe that. And that's it's, it's what I learned from Charlie and it's what I learned from Ed. You, you arguably had two of the best in terms of understanding what motivates high level achievers. And Charlie, who had such phenomenal experience coaching Grace Cornelius uh, as an age grouper, one of the best age group swimmers who ever lived, um, and then parlaying that into learning how to motivate you and, and really, Brendan, creating one of the greatest breaststrokers in the history of the sport. Um, and, and taking that experience and then going to who many would argue is the greatest coach in the history of our sport, Eddie Reese. I mean, you really hit the lottery in terms of the mentors that you had. Do you want to talk about the impact that they had on you? Yeah, I mean – I learned through Charlie how to build a relationship with the coach to where um, we would work together. Um, And that really helped me build a great relationship with Eddie. It also made me much more recruitable. Right. Uh, One of the biggest challenges that we're hearing at USA Swing right now is these athletes going, well, I can't compete, so I can't get recruited. If you're a club coach listening to this, it's your job. Like everyone said, like, remember when you and I were talking about, you were like, hey, man, what's your goal with Austin Swim Club? And I was like, my goal is to be the number one recruited program in the country. Yes. I remember talking about that. Yeah. I'm like, know your role, man. Like as a club coach, I'm a developmental coach. My goal was to get you to college and then college I'll see you at the Olympics. Like I've, I've been there. I don't need to take you there. And, it, and again, in the process of that, we, you and I ran into each other at a lot of national meets and we're had swimmers in some really high end events, right? Like thinking like that. So Charlie really taught me how to build a relationship and ask questions and, and take, he, he was, a, he was very good at, at, at getting me to take ownership of my actions. Again, I was very immature as a young kid with a lot of talent. And he was like, and, and a lot of times that ownership is just, is, is letting somebody fall is letting somebody fail. And then finally them picking up the pieces and coming to you saying, okay, this sucks but I love the sport. How do I get better? And Charlie exactly. did that in practice. He did it with consistency. He did it with expectation. Uh, there, was, there was an expectation level at practice and what you were going to bring every day. And if you didn't bring it, you know, you, it, you were letting him down. And then it's funny because the amount of clout that Eddie Reese walks around the pool deck with at the university of Texas, um, it just, it really fit the mold for me walking in there. And I just said, Coach, I, this is the things I want to do, and here's the summer that I just had, and can we, you know, and we, we built a great relationship after that, and, you know, it's been, it's been really good. The relationship is not, does not have to be personal. It does not have to be like to where I feel like it's a dad's son or a best friend's. I'm talking about giving me the tools to where they're meeting me halfway with their knowledge, and I'm meeting them up. A lot of times as a coach, you have to get that athlete to meet you halfway. That's the number one thing is if you guys can meet here, positive things are going to happen. But a lot of times it's this coach in an ivory tower telling his athletes, I coached Grace Cornelius. So you're going to do what I tell you to do. I, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know that Charlie coached Grace Cornelius till hell. I was like 18, 18 years old. Right. I didn't even know who Grace Cornelius was. I was like, oh, is she good? Like, you know, oh, she magazines like, oh, she's Olympian. Okay, cool. You know, uh, Charlie just found ways to trigger, to, to find a trigger. And that's the, that's the, that's the art of coaching, right? Like that's the fun is that you have Billy, Joe, Billy, Joe, and Sue in the water, and you have to get most out of all three of them in this set, but you have three different human beings in the water. Brent, it's fair to say that a lot of coaches try to establish that personal relationship when arguably you don't need to have it. Mm-mm. 
No. I mean, here's the thing is it's, it's a, it's a mutual respect that I'm here for you and, and you're going to do, you're going to listen to me. Like, and, and that's the thing is like, you could tell that the national team members that would go to an international meet where the coaching staff is totally different. And yep. like, and you're like, well, I'm just going to follow the paperwork out. So my coach gives me at home and we're like, oh, this is not good. Like as a team captain of the Olympics, if we saw that, we were like, okay, how do we get this kid to buy in and engage in the group and be part of the team and get in the training groups so that they can really be where they need to be. And uh, those kids that were, that had the ownership, they were, didn't matter if it was Dave Marsh or Jack Roach or Chris Kubik or whoever was on the pool deck at the Olympics. And if it wasn't Eddie Reese, it wasn't like, that's my coach. And that's who's no, it's a village. Right. And if you're as an athlete, if you learn, if you're taught how to do that, if you're taught how to be coachable, right. And how to build a relationship and ask questions and be engaged in your sport and your race, it doesn't matter who the coach is. I'm going to, I'm going to be, the same way I was as a club coach. I'm going to, if somebody beats me in practice, I'm going to go to that coach and be like, okay, why did he beat me in practice? How do I get yeah. better? You know, there's a, I- there's a great photo of you, uh, hmm. 2012, uh, national team, Olympic team training camp. And Greg Troy is obviously giving you tips now to a lot of outsiders. They're looking at that and saying, why is Greg Troy coaching Brendan Hansen? Brendan Hansen's coach is Eddie Reese, but on the Olympic team, everybody's your coach and talk about why it's important to have those other voices and, and to lean on other people in the national team culture. Because it, it's like, it's like parenting. If you run out of ideas, that's the worst feeling in the world, right? Like you can read all the books that you want to read about having a baby. And then the baby comes and guess what? All the stuff you read in the books has to do with somebody else's kid. And now you got this kid crying at 2 a.m. in the morning and you don't know what to do with him. So what do you do? You go to the playground and you talk to other dads and you're like, hey, man, what do you do for your what do you do for your kid? Right. That's what training camp is about. Training camp is those dads around a playground sitting there going, hey, what do you do for, you know, like I remember Greg was wanting to learn from me about my breaststroke so he could turn around and help Ryan with his breaststroke. And then he was, hey, can we talk with, you know, I want Ryan to be. Did not be, did that not be his weakest stroke? So how do we do that? Um, but you, if you, if you stay, if you continue to gain knowledge, even if it applies to you or not, you may get something from Greg Troy that you're like 30% of it doesn't even apply to you, but the other 70% does in a, in a situation in six months and six weeks where you're going to go race the world. And the difference between first and eighth is two tenths of a second. You want that 70% from Greg. <laughs> yeah. You even if you don't even use it, you just it's a it's like confidence. Like I have the best coaches telling me the best knowledge getting up there to race people. And that's that's where that's where we excel against any other country, man. No doubt about it. There, there's a great uh story that goes around a lot of pool decks in USA swimming, and it's the fact that Eddie got Brendan Hansen, Ian Crocker, and Aaron Pearsall, all on the same team, all high level age group swimmers who would all go on to be individual world record holders. Ian in the butterfly, you in the breaststroke, Aaron in the backstroke. What a recruiting class. What what a group of athletes to have together. How unique were those three in, uh, individual personalities. I know as an insider, but all of you were tremendous age group athletes who then became Olympians. The storied uh, dream world of many swimmers in this country. What qualities did the three of you share? Because Brendan, I could have anchored your 200 medley relay and we still would have medaled at NCAAs and I never went 19 in my life. <laughs> Let's not get out of hand here. Okay. <laughs> it's just starting to feel like a Friday. It's not, it's a Thursday. Um, yeah. No, uh, look, we are all outside the pool. We are all completely different human beings. Um, yeah. And, and I think Ian and Aaron would smirk at that too and say the same thing. Um, though I will say this, that one of the biggest things for us is that when we, like, it, it wasn't, we all had our different talents, right? But the one thing about all three of us, I would say the common denominator was, is that when we got pushed, we pushed back. 
Um, we weren't afraid of a challenge, um, which made workouts insane. Um, absolutely insane. I mean, there's multiple times where Eddie would tell the group, you guys, this is not what I set you to do. You need to slow down. And then Aaron would mouth off like, don't tell me to slow down. Tell me to speed up, you know, and then he would say something. And then it was like, oh, God, here we go, you know. But um, because we all came from different geographic areas, we were all different human beings, but we were all reaching the same goal. It really allowed us to um, feed off of each other um, in a very healthy way um, where I may have lacked in certain technique stuff. Um, I would just try to keep up with the status quo of Ian and Aaron. I was excelled to that level, right? Um, there, you know, there may be something that they do that I do really well in the weight room. And then they turn around and they're like, well, geez, I, I, he's at my level. We're doing the same thing. So then you see Ian benching, you know, 225. It's like, oh, geez, wow. Okay. We're getting somewhere, you know? Um, so I think we, the only common denominator was that you, you didn't mess with us at workout. And, 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 and anytime there was a challenge, it, the, the, there was no dimmer switch to that light switch is my point. Um, when it was on, it was on. Lots of 100 IM repeats where people weren't satisfied with the result at the end and you had to re-race? We would. Yeah. I mean, one time Aaron, I mean, we have it on video. I don't know where it is. You could ask Chris Kubik. But one time we were on a school uh, a team bus going from Auburn to Georgia after Christmas training. And Aaron mouthed off to me saying something like, and I was like, God, I got to swim the breaststroke again or whatever. And he's like, breaststroke's so easy. And he went off and I was like, dude, do you want to go right now? You know, like oh, the tensions are high. Like we're, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's after Christmas training, we're all tired. Eddie's trying to beat us up and we're going to race two top 10 teams in the country. And, uh, and Aaron goes, I bet, you know, uh, and I, I mouthed off and I was like, Aaron, I could beat you wearing a t-shirt and shorts. <laughs> And I'll race you in 100 breaststroke. And he's like, no way, dude. And I was like, let's do it. And Chris goes, guys, not here, not now. He was a junior. I was a senior. So he's like, there's a lot of impressionable people on here. So we didn't do it. We didn't do it at Georgia, but we did it when we got home and we raced. And I was like, I'm going to destroy you. And he was looked at me like the same way. And I, I remember it. It was it was pretty funny. Um, you'll have to ask Chris for that video. I'm not going to tell you what happened. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm absolutely going to tell you. I went 101 with with I went 101 in the 100 yard breaststroke with shorts, mesh shorts, and a t shirt on, and Aaron went 103 with nothing on. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan, what advice do you have for coaches that might have an extremely talented athlete at a relatively young age? How to handle the early parts of their career? Get them to fail. Yes. Get them to fail. Like it, it, I. I knew it, but then I was it was in, it was reinstated to me when Greg Meehan was talking about team culture of his team at Stanford. And Greg and I grew up together in Pennsylvania. His mom was one of my assistant coaches under Charlie. And so Greg and I go way back whenever the Phillies or Eagles or Flyers are in something, we we kind of exchange texts or whatever. But he is Brennan, I mean, he was talking to everyone at ASCA, right? The convention, and he said, the first two weeks of these kids, these freshmen, when they come on the pool deck, he's like, we make sure that they, they fail in a threshold set. Right. And, and we realize that two weeks into the season, when they fail, it's better than like having them be coddled all the way to, to conference. And then they fail at conference because these athletes have never failed before. Like if you go to Stanford, right. You, you've, you've not really failed in academics. And then to be at the level to be on his team at Stanford, you, you, you really haven't had many bad swims. Right. Um, so he's like, we, you're going to eat it. We're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to knock you down. You're going to fail in this set and you're going to cry or whatever's going to happen, but we're going to start the rebuilding process. And that's what he calls the armor of his culture. So that when we come on, like we're not beatable because we beat ourselves up. Right. Like, and so a lot of like you see it a lot of times where kids that are really, really good in let's say 100 breaststroke, right? Like I remember I was really good in 100 breaststroke. And I remember telling coach, like when I was being developed, I was like, look, I don't want to swim the 200 IM. I don't want to swim the 400 IM. I don't want to swim the 500. I don't. I just want to swim the 100 breaststroke. And he's like, yeah. Charlie was like, no, you know what? Now you're not swimming the 100 breaststroke. You're swimming all these other events. And he's like, and you're going to, you're going to have to go these times. And then they let tell you go those times. You don't get to swim the 100 breaststroke again. And I was like, oh, crap. You know, like you got to You got to not make it easy for them because the sport's not going to make it easy for them. 
And if they have the talent and it's fairly easy for them early and you coddle that, you set them set themselves up for a, a mediocre career, in my opinion. Uh, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it, and it leads me into a, a question about how to handle high level achieving athletes, because, you know, as as Michaela was coming up, Dakota was coming up at the same time and Dakota made the world team. I think as a 17 year old, is that right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that you did with Dakota early on to help her handle the, not necessarily the success, Brendan, the expectations that come along with success. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, she was so focused. I mean, her mom's Whitney Hedgepath. So she comes from a very pedigree of, you know, her whole family's athletes. Her mom was a two-time Olympian you know, multiple Olympic medalist. And so Dakota was really, really bought in and was one of my high maintenance athletes, which if they're one of the best, they should be right. Um, that you, you need to have that with that came her own expectations of what she wanted to accomplish. And if it didn't happen at the stage that it needed to happen at, you know, the, the stuff hit the fan, <laughs> like it got bad. So what we tried to do is I, I said to her, I said, look, Let's change the stage. Let's do it in practice. Let's let's find a way to do it in practice. Let's let's get opportunities in practice where you can you can test the theory before you want to go test it in front of 2000 people at trials. Like, let's go test this out. And what happened was, is that. Because of that and because I said, look, I understand what you want to do. And I'm going to help you get there. And this is how we're going to have a conversation moving forward. Like she'd come to me with ideas. Like she was the kid that would look at splits, pay attention to stuff and call Russell Marks. And like, I'm like, oh, right. you know, like she was so bought in. But I had to I had to know that that was who Dakota was. Like that's what wet her whistle. That's what she loved about the sport. And so I had to adjust as a coach because that's not who I was. But I had to adjust as a coach and say, OK, let's do that. But here's what I think. I love what you're saying. But if you need to hold 32s for all these 50s, let's do as many as we can in practice. And if we can go 16, then we sure as hell can go four. You know, absolutely. let's do it. Like, let's let's so that even if we have a bad day or you, uh, you know, you don't hit your tape or whatever, you're still competitive. And it was a very healthy relationship and one that, you know, her and Jack at Georgia, Jack was like, how do I coach her? And I said, look, this is what you need to do. And then Jack was like, I want this kid. He's like, I can work with that. I can do that. I sold Jack on Dakota. Dakota was bought in by Jack. And then, you know, she gets a full ride and goes to Georgia. That's Absolutely. how you coach. You help the athlete get to the next level. Jack's known for getting people to the Olympics. Not me, right? Like, yeah. So I just positioned her for that. And she she bought in. But, man, it was, it was fun. I, I think that's super important what you just said, and, and I don't want to let it get by without addressing it because you just mentioned something that's really challenging for us who have had athletes get to that level, right? <laughs> like you and I are super fortunate in that Dakota went on to swim for one of the greats and a Philly boy in his own right, Jack Bowerly. And I had Michaela get to go swim with Greg Troy for two years and then get Mark Bernardino for two years. I mean – our job is not necessarily to stick with them beyond that. Our job is to say, we've done everything we can do for you at this point. Here's a master. Go run with the master at it. We can make arguments, too, that we have masters in our own right. Somebody like a Mike Parado, who can take a Jenny Thompson, who can take a Reagan Smith and get them to that world-class level. And, you know, a, a Bruce Gemmel, who can do that. Uh, but seminally, our job as age group senior level coaches is to get them to a point where they're going to be successful with that next level coach, that master's level coach. And step with that, Mike, that's the one thing that coaches don't understand is that my first year at Austin Swim Club, I had a 20 lane pool, a brand new 50 meter Mirtha pool, and I had 20 lanes and I had one kid in each lane. And that was my first workout. Not a single kid on that team had a sectional cut. And, and you talk about athletes wanting to celebrate and the importance of celebrating small wins. It's so important for coaches to do that. You know, you're not, it's not that the, the difference between 
you going from no sectional qualifiers to having five sectional qualifiers, that's a huge win for your program. Yes. Right. And you need to celebrate that. And you need to push that back down to your other coaches. You need to celebrate the coaches that instilled in those athletes early on that that's what they needed to do. Like that's how you build a program from that. I, I, I really get uh, sideways with people when they go, I got to, as a club coach, I've got to get a kid to, to, to final at the Olympic trials, or I got to get a kid to make the Olympic team, or I haven't made it. Because that is the same situation as a young 10, 11, 12 year old kid having way too much success way too early in the sport. Because you're dealing with the exact same thing. If a club coach has an athlete go all the way that far into it and doesn't have the backing, but the athlete does, and they're like they're riding the coattails of a, a kid. Man, it it doesn't do well for that coach after after that athlete leaves. Well, a hundred percent, Brendan. Yeah, I mean, that's and so critical. Even getting your athletes as a first or second year club coach, and you say, "Hey, we had two kids make zones this year. That's huge. All right, let's build. Let's go. What? Okay, what's after zones? What's after sectionals?" Now I've got futures. How close am I to juniors? Now I've got my summer junior cut, and now I'm in it. And from there, it's just taking those programmatic steps, right? Yes, and, and, it's, and it's really realistic knowing what you want to do and then being transparent with your team and your staff in what you want to do. My second year at Austin Swim Club, we were a bronze medal team. My boss came up to me and was like, hey, man, you're doing a phenomenal job. Here's a raise, and I said, take that raise and give it to the to give it to my jun my junior one coach because he is the reason I'm getting the athletes that I need up to this level, you know. And and that that little moment right there, that I think it was like five grand. That five grand right there literally catapulted us to gold medal status in a year. Hundred percent. I was crazy, and I'm like. Brendan, talk about the value in mentoring your young coaches. And, and after you talk about that, I do want to get into your parents and how they handled your success at an early age mm -hmm. and then how they parlayed that into you becoming an Olympic champion. Um, people want to work for people that are going to make them better. Right. And you need to instill that in them. So if you if you're if they're coming to work every day and they're like, man, this guy is going to make me a better coach or this girl, me being around them is going to make me a better coach. then they want to be there and they're engaged and they want to coach for you. So that mentality is the same with your athletes as it is your staff. Um, so that professional development aspect of your staff needs to be a priority. You need to instill that in them saying like, look, and again, I was very uh, transparent and vulnerable with the things I would, if we, if we missed a taper and didn't go well, I'd walk in the office on Monday and be like, that was crap, dude. We got our butts kicked the last two days by a team in Dallas. Like Jason, Jason's team in Lakeside just destroyed us. Like, I can't believe that. And I go to the team and I say, guys, what do you think I did wrong? What do, what do, we, what do we need to fix here? And we get the whiteboard out and we would collaborate as a staff. And they were like, wow, he cares about what I think. And we're going to, we're a team of people working together. And then the only other thing I did with my staff is that when I would walk by you on the pool deck, it was just, I would give them the same look as I did when I was playing darts with you. <laughs> I'm going to out coach you today. Like it doesn't matter what's on my piece of paper or what I have in my head for practice today. You better, you better try to bring it. Cause I'm about to, I'm about to bring it. And that competitiveness on the pool deck made it the most fun place to be in Austin from three to eight o'clock at night. I think you touch on something that's critically important there. And I do it with my staff right now. Every once in a while, I'll go down, I'll coach a developmental group practice. Every once in a while, I'll jump into the 11, 12, we call it our performance group. I want my group when they finish, no matter if it's our national level kids or our 10 and unders, I want them to go home that night after practice and say, mom, Coach Mike, we had the best practice we've had all <laughs> yeah. And then you better believe that I'm going to the staff the next day and I'm saying every single kid in that group went home and they were talking about mom, to mom and dad how fun practice was. That competitive drive is important in your staff. It is. And it's the easiest way to keep your team competitive. 
instead of relying on the process or relying on the system of whatever you have in place with your team and how you're going to get these kids faster, that's one piece of the pie, whether it's USRPT or, you know, mesocycles and whatever you've got, that's one piece of it. But for your kids to respond when another team pushes them up against the corner, like Jason's team did to me at sectionals my first year, the next year I was like, guys, that's the only guy I want to beat on the pool deck. I was like, and I would tell him that. I was like, let's go kick his butt. I was yep. like, let's go. And then they bought into it. They were like, yes. And it became a meet inside of meet. Every guess what? Lakeside and, and Austin Swim Club swam lights out, you know? And it was super yep. fun. And it was one of the, I mean, I, I took kids all the way to trials, but sectional meets were sometimes the most fun meets for us. The, the best thing that's happened to RLSC in the last year is that our very good friend TJ Day is now yeah. and so he and I do that at every single LSC meet and I'm telling you it's our collaborative goal as coaches of two of the bigger teams to make the LSC better to say come on up and race and and that's a whole other webinar that we can do but one of the things that I wanted to ask you and that's seminally important in the development of athletes moving forward is just how important it is for parents to manage expectations. Your mom and dad had the great fortune of having an extraordinarily talented athlete, somebody who would go on to set world records and win Olympic medals. They didn't know that that was going to happen, but there are things that they did that helped guide you towards that place. Can you talk about the role that your mom and dad played in the development of you as a young age grouper transitioning to the highest elite levels in our sport. My parents will tell you, they didn't raise a swimmer. They raised a, a, a human being. They raised, they like so many of the characteristics of me as a competitor have to do with our family values. Um, I remember as a kid growing up, it was you leave a place better than you found it. So to me, when I left the University of Texas, the last practice, I left a university that I felt like they still talk about some of the sets that I did there. So I left it better than when I got there. So where my mom was basically teaching me to clean up after myself and, you know, uh, make sure that I, I, I take care of all the things that I was doing in that room before I walked out of it was the same. That, that those characteristics just really folded over. And it, it was, again, the consistency aspect of it. But my parents, my parents never had to manage necessarily like like tone it down or control it they would just say they would continue the conversation past what i said i wanted to do so if i came to them and said hey look i want to be number one in the state this summer my dad would say yeah how are you gonna do that like he'd act dumb he's like well what did coach say yeah well you know uh, did you are you practicing that way you know like he would ask questions again now it's forcing me to take ownership of what I just said rather than my dad saying, hey, you know what? I think you can, too. That's the worst thing somebody could say. Right. When, you, when a parent should say that the day they do it, like my dad hugged me on my shoulders when I won a silver medal in 2004 and I was mad I didn't win the gold. But he was like, man, I'm so proud of you. I knew you could do this. That's when he said it. But going into that summer, two summers prior to that, he was just like, hey. You know, you're going to the, what are you going to do it? Well, how are you going to do it? You say you want to break a world record. What, what, what does that look like? Talk me through it. You know, I'm dumb. I'm your dad, tell me. Absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things that many parents forget to instill, and it's, it's something that my parents spent a lot of time on with, with my brothers and I, are attitude and effort. How have you educated your parents over the course of the last few years on the importance of attitude and effort? Consistency is one thing that I think really helps is that there, I don't, I don't, I'm not hot. I was never hot and cold. It wasn't like uh, one minute where it was a higher expectation of what we were capable of doing, even after we got really, really good. And we had athletes at all levels of the sport. Did I change the, the, the attitude and effort, it was tweaks, right? Like based off of what we were trying to achieve as a group, but the attitude and effort was, it was really based around, if I teach you why you're going to do something, you're gonna give me more effort. I, I feel like that is a huge missed opportunity by a lot of people as they say, 
Hey, Brandon, go, go eight, 200 uh, breaststroke on two thirty. Um, you know, go hold like two fifteens. Okay. But when I was being coached, it was Eddie, it was Charlie saying, Hey, Brennan, let's go eight, 200 on two thirty. Let's go two fifteen. But I want you thinking about that third 50 of your 200 breaststroke where you can't, you want to, you want to come up, but you got to stay under for that, that underwater pullout, right? That the get in that moment of that pain burning of that, get there as soon as you can on these eight, two hundreds and then hold it as long as you can. Guess what? I'm going 208s from a push. Why? Because I'm like, I want, I'm, all I'm locked in on is that third 50 of a 200 breaststroke in, in, a, in a race. Right on. Yeah. Like if you want to control, like, and I tell the parents that on the first night, I say, look, I'm going to teach your kids how to do it. I'm going to teach them why they need to do it. And then we're going to continue to stay process driven all the way to the finish. Don't talk about results at home. They'll happen. Talk about like your own actions. Results don't happen if your actions don't match up to it. So value systems at home. Exactly. 100%. And, and you know what? A lot of times that communication that I, I would throw bones to my parents. Like if, in the beginning, trust me, I made all the mistakes you can possibly make. My parents hated me. But as soon as I learned it more, I was like, oh, wait, the more I, the more I communicate with them and tell them what I'm doing on the pool deck, the more space they give me to do what I need to do with the athlete. So uh, keeping them in the know is really, really important and giving them tools. Like I would, I would tell the parents, like uh, we had progress reports for our kids under the age of 14 on our team. Why? Because I wanted to control the conversation in the car or ride home with that. Exactly. So I would say, hey, look, this week we're going to do a test set where it's going to be a 500 freestyle for time. Here's what we're working on. If you want to ask your kid about it, here are questions to ask your kid. So, right were armed when they got in the water and they go, Hey, how was the 500? They're like, coach is so mean to me. He picked on me. He'd be like, no, 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 no. Hold on. Coach said that the 500 was to really understand your base and your fitness level coming off of a long summer. So, you know, it's just where you are. Like it allows the parent to be part of the process when you can arm them with a question like that. That was, that, those were the kind of like low hanging, not low hanging, but just like little wins that really helped us a lot. Talk about, Brendan, why it's so important for moms and dads not to jump to the evaluative process after a competition. It's not sustainable. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like, because it's, it's a broken system. Like, kids are going to get faster from the age of 8 to 11. Why? Not because of what they do in practice, because they grow. They grow. They get bigger. Then from 11 to 14, right, that starts to be where they get into practice and stuff. So if you're if you're at home and you're a parent and you're plotting stuff on dots and charts and you got progressions and all this stuff and I'm faster than Brendan Hansen was at this time and blah, 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 it's not going to add up because because eventually you're going to get to the point where it's just about touching the wall first. The whole cycle comes back around again. The way you started swimming when you were a summer leaguer and it was about touching the wall first, well, guess what? You go all the way through the whole thing, you get to the Olympics, guess what? I don't care whether I go 59.3 or 59.7. I'm touching the wall first, right? So stop worrying about those things because they're not sustainable because it's it's go naturally, if the kid goes through the program or goes through swimming properly, it's what it's going to do. Guys, this is what I try to tell parents is I'm like, and you're more than welcome to use this. And this is something I'm working with Russell Marks on right now is I'm like, when I came back in 2011, I swam from 2011 to 2012. I swam for 24 months. I never went a best time. I never went a best time. It was the most fun swimming I ever had. Right. And I won, I, I won the, the senior nationals. I won two national titles and I won a bronze medal and a, and a, and a gold medal in, the, in that time. So it's not, when you get when you teach parents to focus on the process, that kid is going to be the most coachable person on the pool deck through their entire career. And that is the most dangerous kid in your program all the way through. Brendan, when I when I watched you and you and I are the same age, so we got to go to a lot of the same meets together, nationals, so on and so forth. You, Aaron, Ian, Michael, most of the time, you guys were having fun. Yeah. Talk about the aspect of having fun as one of the root causes for why we put our children in our sport. 
you, <laughs> you have to, again, it's, it's know your priorities, right? Like know what they are all the time. And like, you have to, you have to check in on all of those different areas, your fitness, your, your social life, your, you know, your health, your sleep, your fun factor, Right. And I remember we came off of Colorado Springs one time. This is a true story. Came off of a Colorado Springs one time and it was Michael, Cleet Keller, Eric Vant, myself, um, Ian, Aaron, Neil Walker, Nate Deucing, and Tommy Hannon. We had gone to Colorado Springs with Jack Roach and Baba Bowman and uh, John Urbanchek and we had got hammered for like two weeks straight. Right. So we go to Santa Clara. We're at the Grand Prix and we all swim prelims in the morning. We're all like we make it back, but we're all like rough. And I remember Jack Roach pulling us aside and being like, why are we not smiling? Are we not having fun? Like what is going on? And then he made us go into the little, that little warm down pool that's behind the area. And he's like, I want, this is your warm up. You need to play tag. And so we play a shallow pool that's in the back. Yeah, real shallow pool. So you got these, these seven Olympians. (laughs) Playing tag. Guess what we did that night of finals. Everybody went lights out best times in season. You, you you can't you have to recognize your athletes and know when they're in a certain state like that and help them through it. And guess what? Some unconventional thing like tag in a short four lane pool behind Santa Clara was better than any of us going between fifteen hundred and three thousand with pace and warm up. Like, doesn't make sense, but it's not supposed to. And you got to keep that fun part of it in there, man. And and then. And you see it like where you, if you notice your team's getting really focused and really close to it, you got to find ways to, to, to sprinkle in that fun in there to calm them down and be like, wow, OK, you know, make sure that 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 section of their priorities is full. Right. It's in the black. It's not in the red. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and, and one thing that I wanted to, to ask you when and you just touched on it with what Jack Roach did. What strategies can club coaches use within their program that are going to cultivate a focus on the process of development, the steps involved in that process, Brendan, and the patience, right? The patience that are required for growth. Patience from us as coaches, the athletes understanding that it's not going to happen overnight, and the patience probably most importantly with parents, with moms and dads who understand first that this is an activity That's to be used as a vehicle for success in life, not as a vehicle for trophies and becoming a pro athlete. You have to, you you have to set a goal for your team that is not result driven. First off, it has to be the process. So I told you that my 10,000 foot view of Austin swim club was to be, was to be what was to be the most recruitable team in the country division one division three all the way through i wanted kids to get to college parents were bought into that they were excited about that because they saw the investment that they had made in the sport and they were going to get there so the parents were patient because i knew i said look my number one goal is to have your kid go to a college that they never thought they could go to get an education they never thought they could get to and be part of a team that they never thought they could be a part of said my goal for that season was process driven. We're going to be the best kicking team in the country. That's what we're going to do. I don't know. You know, in my right. like, that's like, uh, do we want 10 section qualifiers? You know, my, my coaches would come back to me and be like, look, I'm going to try and get this many qualifiers here, this many. I'm like, I don't know. Get every single one of your kids to go under 45 for a flutter kick 50 freestyle. You do that and everything on that, all those numbers are doubled. Love it. And so it's it's that mentality. But here's here's the low hanging fruit that I I don't understand why coaches don't do this. But I'll tell you this. It has been a silver lining for covid. And Mike, I don't mean to cut you off, but I got to go because I got to work. I got to go back to work. (laughs) But here it is. You have to build a support staff of other coaches to bang ideas off of. If you don't have a mentor, if you don't have somebody that you can ask these ideas to and, and, and and get real feedback from them. You're, you're, if you feel like you're on an island coaching by yourself, those kids are not going to get any better. If you want to improve the experience of your athletes on your team, go, go interview, go find other coaches, go find people that are doing things great because they're out there, right? Use the community of coaches out there to, to help you 
And I'll tell you, when you come back to your, your program and you tell them like, hey, man, I was talking to so-and-so in California and he's got this kid and they were telling me that like he's been kicking like this, so we got to do it. He, they're like, what? That's awesome. Let's do it. You know, like they're bought in. Why? Because it's something new and it's fun and they see the creativity of it. So I think COVID has forced coaches to come out of their shell a little bit and communicate together on Zoom, on other areas. You and I, we and TJ and a group of us from the National Select Camp, we had a group text message going. And it was like, I told you, like I had it's been going for years. It's been yeah, going I've had, for years. I've had high profile, high caliber coaches on my pool deck constantly, but I learned more on how to pivot and, and be adaptive and, and be effective with my team from that group text message across the diversity of that group of coaches from the National Select Camp. And that can be created at the LSC level. That could be created um, at a sectional meet. You know, you just have to be the one that goes out there and says, hey, look, I want to do something for my team today. So I'm going to go make two, five new friend coaches and say, hey, look, in the year, can we talk about test sets and maybe our 10 and unders can race or something, you know? That's the kind of stuff that needs to happen because when that does, right now, USA Swimming is the, you know, we're the best best in the NGBs, right? Like we're really, really good. We win a lot of gold medals. As far as Olympic standard, we're the best. We start doing that and it's just like you just take the wind out of everybody else's sails. China, Japan, and then we're, and then all of us are sitting here going, man, wait, uh, like you will, there'll be a cringe factor to 2032 trials where we're all like, I don't know. I don't know who's going to win, you know? <laughs> I don't know who's going to make top 800 free. It scares the crap out of me. That to me would be an awesome conversation to have over darts. <laughs> Absolutely, man. And and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm never playing darts with you again. <laughs> Come on, man. But You're too competitive. If there's money, especially if there's money on the table. No, Brendan, no. listen, we, we've we spent uh, an hour and 20 minutes and you and I could go on all day. We really appreciate you coming on the program. You bet, dude. I appreciate it. I appreciate everything you're doing. And I just – I hope I hope people take this and and do something with it. I am I by no means am I an expert. I, I take on these experiences because I know I learned something. And every time I'm hanging out with you, Mike, I learn something. So I just appreciate all you're doing for the sport, man. And 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 you know everybody that wants anything that I can help them with with USA Swimming Wise. And this is the transparency aspect of this. My phone number seven one nine four four zero zero seven four nine. My email address Brendan Hansen at USA Swimming org. Let's go make somebody faster. No doubt about it. And I have no doubt that you will continue to do that. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Brennan, thanks so much. Greg Olmstead, stay to the end of the. Uh, nice, buddy. Greg's going to get a free fitter and faster mask as well as a fitter and faster beach towel. Uh, thanks for staying on, guys. Brennan, fantastic as always. Look forward to talking with you more in the future. And uh, all the best of you and, and all the staff at USA Swimming. Thanks, buddy. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks a lot, guys. Stay tuned next week for Fitter and Faster with Jim Ellis, legendary coach from the Philadelphia Department of Recreation. We'll have Coach Ellis on uh, the program on Monday. And then Jeremy Lin will be taking over a new show. Jeremy Lin's show is Fast Times with Jeremy Lin on Tuesday. Jeremy's going to have Paul Yetter on the program as well as uh, Olympic medalist John Olson. So, Stick with the program. Uh, look forward to seeing you all come back. Thanks for logging in to Fitter and Faster. We'll talk to you soon.